Hey church, welcome to Frontline Community Church Podcast. My name is Cody Mahaffey and I'm the connections and group pastor here at Frontline in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So our mission here is simple, to see zero people unchanged by Jesus. So whether you've been following Jesus your whole life or your journey has just begun, we hope that this message will help draw you near to the person of Jesus. Be challenged and encouraged by his word and be moved to action. We hope these next few moments are a blessing to you and equip you to see who God really is and who you really are in him. Well, hey, good morning, Frontline. It's just good to see all of you. If you're here in the room, it's good to have you. If you're joining, watching, listening online. Uh, Today, we close out our series on money. It's called In God We Trust. Uh, We've looked at a couple different ways that we relate to money, and obviously, it's a play on words, right? Uh, In God We Trust is imprinted on our money, but it kind of gets at that truth of, uh, do we really? Do we really trust God, or is it easier, or do we operate out of a place a lot of times that we actually trust our money rather than him. So as we close it out today, I just I was thinking about the Bible and a number of different stories all throughout the Bible that demonstrate people who were obedient to God, especially when it cost them something or it required them uh, to do something, give something, sacrifice something. People who were obedient to God who said yes to him before they knew how it would work out, often very simple acts of obedience led to very extraordinary outcomes that only God could orchestrate. And so some of those I wanted to share with you, even if you're not familiar with the Bible, here's a couple quick uh, illustrations. Moses uh, was the leader of the Israelite people in the Old Testament. He led his people out of Egypt into uh, the wilderness where he led them for 40 years. But as they were exiting Egypt, uh, Pharaoh came after them. So he sent the Egyptian army after them. The Israelites got trapped between this chasing Egyptian army and the Red Sea. And God says, you know, extend your hands over the Red Sea. And so Moses has an opportunity. Does he be obedient? Does he do what God says? Or does he look for an alternative route? Does he try to get around it? And he's obedient. He extends his hands over the waters. And it says the waters of the Red Sea parted and the Israelites crossed on dry land. The next leader that followed Moses, his name was Joshua. They were in the wilderness. They came upon an enemy. Uh, That enemy was Jericho. And they were a fortified city. They had walls all around Jericho. And so it's, here's the question that Joshua has. How are we going to get this city, God? If you've called us to conquer them, how? And God says, I want you to just march in a circle around them seven times. That doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. If you're talking war strategy, I don't know how familiar you are, but that usually doesn't work. But Joshua said, okay. And so they marched around seven times. On the seventh day, they marched seven times and the walls of Jericho just crumbled down. Simple act of obedience led to this extraordinary outcome only that could have been orchestrated by God. Here's another one. Uh, Ruth, this woman Ruth was very loyal to her mother-in-law. Both her husband and then her mother-in-law's husband passed away. And so she had the opportunity to go back to her own family, but she actually decided to stay with Ruth. Just a very godly woman, stayed with her, stayed connected to her, sacrificed for her. And what ended up happening is her story became grafted into the lineage of Jesus. A very simple act of obedience that had a pretty extraordinary outcome. The last one's one of my favorites. Uh, It's a little boy whose mom probably packed his lunch that day. Jesus was teaching a large group of people, 5,000 that were in attendance and it's lunchtime and people are hungry. And this little boy has his lunch, right? Five loaves or five, whatever it was, five loaves of bread, two fish, five fish, two loaves. You look it up. He had one of them. He had his sack lunch. Then he offers it up to Jesus and he goes, here, you can have this. And what happens, the story plays itself out. Jesus feeds all of them. Small, simple act of obedience led to a pretty extraordinary outcome that could have only been orchestrated by God. See, God's not impressed, I think, by us taking risk. I think he's impressed by us being obedient, even when it's risky. So that's what we're talking about today is the obedience factor. Will we be obedient to God? Will we do what he has actually said for us to do? Will we do what he's put in the Bible and the invitation that he calls us to follow Jesus? Even Matthew 28, it says, go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey what Jesus had taught. We're talking about obedience today. And so to do that, we're looking at Matthew chapter 25. Jesus was teaching his disciples. Uh, He was also interacting with Pharisees. And he was talking about like, someday the son of man's going to come back. Someday I'm going to come back. 
Someday I'm, I'm going to return, and here's what it's actually going to be like. Check this out, Matthew 25, verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Notice, it's not the servant's wealth. It's the master's wealth being entrusted to the servants. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. This word entrusted, uh, it was normal in this time for especially someone who was very wealthy, very powerful. They would take their finances and they would entrust stewards to it, people that worked for them, reported to them, people that they oversaw, he would entrust his wealth to him with an expectation that there would be a return, that you would take it, you'd put it to work, you'd do something with it. So, so the master entrusts his servants with his wealth, but it's a very significant amount of wealth. In fact, this bag of gold, right, or this, this bag of gold, it was actually equivalent to around 20 years of wages, so to one, he gives 100 years of wages. To another, he gives 40 years of wages. And to the third, he gives about 20 years of wages. And it says, each according to his ability. You following so far? So let's see what happens here if we keep reading. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work. Catch that, he went at once. He went immediately. He went right to it and he put the money to work and he gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more, but the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Here's what I want you to catch. The first two were obedient. The first two understood the assignment. In fact, I would argue with you, all three of them understood the assignment, but the first two understood and their understanding led to an action of obedience. They took their master's wealth, they put it to work. I don't know if that means in the stock market, I don't know if that means real estate, I don't know if that means you know small investments here and there, whatever it was, they took it and were diligent with the command that the master had left with them. Take this and turn something for it. Use it. Do something with it. The purpose we're talking about money today is because money is often a microcosm for how we relate to God or other people. The servants understood that the master had given them a task, a responsibility that they were required to carry out. And so their posture was, I'm going to be obedient to the master even before I know how it's going to work out. The first two had no idea that their profits would double the original investment. But here's what's funny about it. It was all the masters anyway. It was all his, their job, their duty, their responsibility was to be obedient, to put it to work, to go after it, to work hard and to be prepared for the day that the master returns to have something to show for it. But the third one does something different. Third one takes a shovel, takes this bag of gold, 20 years worth of wages, a significant amount of money takes it, finds a spot out back. I don't know if he goes to his yard, he goes to a nature preserve. I don't know where he goes, but wherever he goes, he digs a hole, he marks the spot, he remembers it, he puts it in the ground and he walks away. He does nothing. If, if you notice even the text, it, it just says he went off. It doesn't say he went immediately like the first dude. It just, he went off. He got to it when he got to it. He'll deal with it when it gets around to it. Before we go on with the story, I mean, I just, I want to ask you, is there a, a servant in this story that you identify with? Is there one that, that you would look at your life, you'd look at maybe what God has given you or entrusted to you, you'd look at your time or your energy, your wealth, you look at your gifts or your talents, your skills. If you look at what God has given you, are, are you representative of one that you feel like, wow, I'm like the one with five. I feel like I have an abundance. I feel like I have a lot. I have a lot of I have a lot that I, I've been entrusted with from God. Maybe, maybe you more identify with the middle one. I've been given some from the master, probably not as much as others that are around me or in my sphere of influence, but certainly more than others that are around me in my sphere of influence. I, I see myself in the middle. Maybe that's you, or maybe you're the last one. And you see yourself as one who goes, I, I haven't been entrusted with much. I look at everybody else, it seems like everybody else has more. They got more opportunity, more money, more wealth, more time, more freedom, more, more everything. God's given them so much more and I've only got this little. There, there's something I think that happens in our heart posture, especially when we, when we look horizontally, that, that if we see ourselves as, as the one who has won, 
uh, sometimes we get resentful. I think sometimes we look at God and we say, why, why, why one for us? What have I done to deserve that? How come I can't have what they have? And sometimes our heart postures, we start getting angry or frustrated. Our heart posture that, that desires more, wants more, sometimes that turns into a very different type of attitude that relates to God. And remember, money is a microcosm. It's this small little window into maybe how we operate in a variety of different ways in our lives. Maybe, maybe you're the one that you go, I, I'm always overlooked at work. I'm always overlooked in the classroom or I'm always overlooked in my neighborhood. I'm always overlooked in my family. I'm always the one that gets the least and the least is expected from me. And so it turns, right? It's like, maybe I won't be obedient. Maybe I won't do what's expected of me. Maybe I won't do what God has actually asked me to do because what's it gonna make? What difference is it gonna make anyway? Which one do you identify with now? Man, if I'm being honest, I, I identify with all three of them at different phases or stages of life, sometimes all three at the same time. Just depends on what you're talking about. If we camp in the lane of money, just for a little bit and, and use this as an illustration to get in. What, which one do you identify with? But let's keep reading here. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and he settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The word I want to camp on just in this little section here, is faithful. Faithful. I don't know what you think of when you hear that word, read that word, see that word, but faithful, right? Sometimes I think like, oh, these guys had faith, right? They, they had faith that if they did what they were supposed to, there would be an outcome. And, and our, our often, uh, sometimes our intention is we look for the outcomes and we go, yeah, there it is. That's what I was after. That's what we wanted. Our temptation in this story is to celebrate the fact that the first two doubled their money especially as Americans, we, we look at the outcome. We look at the bottom line. Were they in the black or were they in the red? Woo, doubled it. Way to go. Those guys are awesome. That's our temptation in this passage. But, but I think what we overlook is that word faithful because it doesn't just mean they had faith that the outcome would be good. The word faithful actually translated means in the transaction of business, in the execution of commands, or in the discharge of official duties. That's what faithful means. Faithful is a fancy word for obedient. The first two were praised, celebrated, high-fived by their master, not because they had faith, because they were obedient, because they, they saw from the very beginning to the very end, everything that I have been entrusted with does not belong to me, it belongs to my master. And because it belongs to my master, the command that my master gave to me requires me to act out of it, to be obedient to it, which means the outcome is belonging to the master. If they double or triple or quadruple their money, the end is the same. It is still the master's. The only thing they can be held accountable for is their level of obedience. The first two are praised for it, celebrated for it. Remember, Jesus is the one teaching his disciples saying, this is what it's going to be like when I come back. I will celebrate and high five the one that is obedient to me, not just in money, but in every area of their lives. But what about the one that's not obedient? What, what, what about the one that, that chooses not to? Here, here's what I want you to hear if we could boil it down to a statement. The statement would be this, obedience is the outcome that God is after. So often we're focused on, well, what's, what's the outcome of obedience? 
that will determine whether or not I should do what I feel like I'm being told to do or asked to do or led to do. We look at the outcome. The outcome that God looks at is our heart of obedience. So let's read the last piece of the story here and see what happens. It says, Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man. Notice how he starts. Notice the posture, the attitude. There's this undercurrent of like, before I'm about to tell you what I'm about to tell you, I would like to tell you that it's basically your fault. That's how this is coming across. The word hard, this particular use of the word hard is only used a couple times in scripture and it actually means harsh. It is the same word that is used in the Bible to describe Pharaoh when Pharaoh was at his worst to the Israelite people, to God's people in Egypt, when he worked them harder and harder and harder, and then he took things that they needed to produce what he was demanding they would produce. That's the word that was chosen to describe Pharaoh as harsh, mean, wicked, unreasonable. That that is how this servant begins his interaction with his master. I knew you to be a pharaoh of sorts. I know how harsh you can be here if we continue it. Harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. Do you feel the difference of the tension between the first two and the third one? I mean, if you put yourself in the master's shoes, right? You have three kids. The first two function like that, and the last one functions like this. What's your posture towards number three? Maybe you're a business owner and you have employees and your employees come to you and they bring the same kind of report. The first two did what you asked them to do. The third one didn't because it was your fault. What's your posture towards that employee? I just want us to get at the heart here. It's not so much the outcome of obedience that the master cares about. The outcome the master cares about is obedience itself. Did you do what I asked you to do? Were you faithful? The third one just blames him. It's your fault. In fact, you're so harsh and you're so scary. And I, I worried that if I invested, if I actually took what you gave me seriously, that what if it didn't go well, then I can't imagine being on the other side of you. So instead of being obedient and risking it because of obedience, I decided to play it safe. And by play it safe meant disobedience. That's what I chose. That's what I've decided. That doesn't fly with the master just like it doesn't fly with God. The opportunity he gives us is to be obedient not to determine whether or not we'll be obedient based on the outcome. Who are you in the story? Who do you relate to? Who do you want to be? Like we said earlier, I I don't think God is impressed when we take risk. I think God is impressed when we are obedient to him, even in the face of risk. His heart, is obedience for his children, just like the heart of a parent is obedience for their child. Would you obey me? Would you follow me? Would you trust me? Because I can lead you to a place you cannot get to on your own. Because I can do far more with obedience than you can with effort. If you will trust me, if you will follow me, if you will lean on me, even just like we were saying, I can lead you to a place you could never go to on your own, but it all hinges on obedience. Here's how the master responds to the servant. The master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him, give it to the one who has 10 bags for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the same 
as the person that says, God, I will not be obedient to you. I will not follow you. I will not submit to you. In fact, when push comes to shove, I will blame you for my own disobedience. And I honestly don't want anything to do with you because this is how I see you. You're harsh. It's the person that builds a life, a career, a house, a retirement, a legacy that revolves all around them. I refuse to be obedient. I refuse, God, because what if it costs me? You know, Brian talked last week about Malachi 3, how God gives us the invitation when it comes to our finances to establish the type of relationship that we have with him. When we go first, right, even in the, in the realm of tithing, when we go first, when we trust the Lord with that first 10%, when we give back what has already belonged to him, when we give it back, it postures our heart in a totally different way as we relate to him. It says, God, it is you that I trust. God, it is you that I follow. It is you that I submit to. Jesus, you are a king. You're not just a prophet. You're not, you're not just a priest. You're not just a shepherd. Jesus, you are my king. Therefore, I will obey you like one obeys a king. I realized as I've sat with this sermon, as I processed this, as I worked on this message, I mean, it, this one was hard. I had to dig a whole lot deeper in my own heart because I was trying to figure out why, why deep down do I still resist this? Well, I mean, I, I'm just telling you, why, why do I personally, David, why do I resist this when it comes to God? And here's what I arrived at. I, I often uh, derive two things, particularly from money. Uh, that I've discovered that are very problematic for my life. Number one is this, it's significance. Uh, when you're competitive, money is a great scoreboard. It's easy to count. It's easy to see. It's easy to compare. There's, there's a lifestyle that it opens up or access to, whatever. This is everything from what you drive to what phone you have to what kind of house you live in to what bank account number is represented, your Roth IRA or your 401k or your 403b, whatever it is. You go, oh, man, this, this is an easy scoreboard for me. And when it's bigger, I feel bigger. You know how problematic that is? Because that, that actually cuts both ways. When that gets smaller, I feel smaller. All of a sudden, I, I've attached my identity to this thing that has no bearing, no true compass as to where my identity actually is because it is totally apart from who God says I am. The invitation God gives all of us is you, you find your significance in me. You want to be significant, be a part of my kingdom. Follow my ways. Live like I lived. Die to yourself like I did. You want to find significance. It is only rooted in Jesus. But then here's the other thing that I, I continue to derive from money. It's security. You, you ever feel safer when you have more money or your bank account's higher or you're closer to retirement and it seems padded and it's protected? I mean, the way I think about it is it's like, if there's me, then, then all these other things are like, uh, it's houses and then roofs and then walls and then moats and then alligators and whatever it is that just surrounds. It's like nothing's getting close, right? I'm impenetrable. When, when we start finding our security in something like money, it drives us away from finding our security in God. I was praying in my office a couple months ago and that uh, what I felt like God said, I was really struggling with security. Going, God, I feel like you just, you keep asking me to let go. You keep asking me to let go, and it makes me feel insecure. It's like you're asking me to open the gate or put a bridge down. or whatever. And It's like, God, I feel vulnerable. I feel insecure. I feel weak. And what I felt like God said, what it felt like he put on my heart was, David, you are never more secure than when you are with me. Now, that's a truth you can build your whole life on. But, but it's risky. It's costly. Will we actually be obedient to God even when it's risky? That's what this master was after in this whole story. We have this saying here at Frontline. Uh, it goes like this, yes before how. Maybe you've heard it before. You've heard us say it before. Or maybe you've seen it on our website or social media or something like that. Yes before how uh, has a real significant meaning because it's a postured heart towards obedience to Jesus. 
That, that's what it means. So here, here's what it means. The yes means I will obey. I will do what you say, God, especially in the realm of money, because money leads to a lot of other things. It's a microcosm for how we relate in a variety of other ways. When we say yes before how, we mean my first answer will be yes out of obedience to what you are calling and leading me into. But the how means I will say yes before I know how it'll work out. The yes means before uh, it means, yes, I will do it. I will be obedient before I know what it will cost for me or my business or my job or my employees, my ministry, my classroom, my church, my future. Yes before how means I will say yes to you, God, before I know how it's going to work out, before I know the outcome. This is what's evidenced in the first two servants. They said yes to their master before they knew what would happen. And their obedience led to a totally different result. What do you think God's putting on your heart? What, what do you think he's prompting you with? What is he asking you to be obedient to him with in your life that's hard right now? You have this closed fist, like, I don't want to let that go because if I let it go, I, it's risky. God might lead me to a place I don't want to go. It, it might cost me something I'm not willing to give up. See, money has this way of identifying our priorities. It shows us what is significant to us, and it shows us where God ranks on our list of things we care about most in our hearts. God's asking us, will you put me first? Will you be obedient to me? Because if you'll do it with your money, there's a great chance you'll do it in every other area of your life. What is it that God's stirring inside of you. And again, it's because of this, because obedience is the outcome that God is after. The, the truth that I'm wrestling with in my own life is that I will only derive significance and I will only derive security from the person of Jesus because what he has already done for me. I mean, I was joking with somebody this morning, um, before service started, I said, you know, I, I really believe that God called me to be a pastor so that I would wrestle with this stuff on a much deeper level than I probably ever would otherwise. I mean, it has forced me and sometimes tormented me to just sit and go, why do I feel the way I feel? Why do I resist the things that I resist? Why do I push back on? Why do I run from? Why do I rebel? Why do I feel anxious or insecure about all these other things? And it's because of this. For some reason, I just have a hard time trusting that Jesus is who he says he is. When push comes to shove, I go, oh, do you love me? Will you care for me? Will you provide for me? Will you lead me when it's so insecure or chaotic? Will, it forces me to go, and I need to answer, yeah. And you take a step. You say yes before how. I've had to learn to do this over and over and over and over in so many areas of, your, of my life. And, and what I would tell you is he's been faithful every single time. Every single time. Sometimes I see the outcome, sometimes I don't. But it's because obedience is the outcome that God is after. He's after a heart that has postured itself before him, underneath him, submissive to him. So what's your yes before how? Is there something that you feel like God is putting on your heart or leading you to right now that's hard for you to be obedient it's hard for you to let go. It's hard for you to say, okay. It's hard for you to give, or it's hard for you to sell, or it's hard for you to sacrifice. What is the area of your life right now that God's saying, will you trust me? Will you actually say yes before you know how it worked out? What is it for you? As an organization here at Frontline, we are trying to do this uh, for the sake of our community. You've heard Cody talk about it a little bit this morning, even with the children's camp coming up this summer. Our heart is to reach our community. And, and we could have went with Spring Hill, who we had before. And I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you, it's way more convenient for us. Uh, it's way less time intensive for us. It's less creative intensive for us. It's less volunteer intensive for us. It's all these other things. But what we felt like God was leading us to is, will you say yes before how? Will you be obedient and create something that is accessible for the community on a far greater level and trust me, 
So that, that's why we're doing what we're doing this summer. There, there's another uh, couple of things we're doing right now, Hand to Hand. Uh, Hand to Hand is one of our most significant partners here at Frontline. Uh, Hand to Hand partners churches and schools together to meet the needs of kids who are hungry who don't have enough food on the weekends. That's what we do. I've been praying for this for probably a year and a half. God, would you give us the Northview schools? And starting in June this year, we'll have four of them. We'll have four schools. What an opportunity for us as a church to say, we'll lean in. We'll say yes before how. We'll say yes to meeting the needs of people outside that we drive past, that we live next to, that we work alongside, that we go to school with. We're going to say yes. We're going to take a step forward and say, God, we'll be obedient and follow you even when it's risky for us. Another one is our essential store. Last month, we served 167 families in our community. The month before that was December, we served 184. We're talking six to 700 people in our community that are coming here for essential items. All we're doing is saying, yes, God, we'll help meet those needs. We don't know where the money's coming from. We don't know where the product's coming from. We, we don't know a lot of the hows. We don't know how it's gonna work out, but we feel like you're calling us to be obedient. So we're gonna continue to say yes, and we're gonna step into it. Ukro, Ethiopia, we have a partnership there we have a care point and we've said yes this week they have an additional 20 kids in that program that need sponsors so we said yes we prayed about it we sat with it we felt like God's leading us to it do I know how we're going to pay for all this no do I know how we're going to provide for all of this no do I know if you're going to volunteer or give of your time or give of your treasure no but I'm trusting that if God's leading us to it our act is to be open and so I would just ask you, what, what is the yes that God's putting on your heart? What is he inviting you to step into? Just for the sake of obedience so that he can have an impact even through you, through us, far greater than anything we tried to do on our own. There's this book, it's called Why Revival Tarries. Uh, tarries means delay. But why revival delays? It's written by a man named Leonard Ravenhill. And he, here's what he writes. He says, one of these days, some simple soul will pick up the book of God, read it, and believe it. Then the rest of us will be embarrassed. We have adopted the convenient theory that the Bible is a book to be explained, whereas first and foremost, it is a book to be believed, and after that, obeyed. Jesus looked at his disciples. He told them, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Friends, I, I just want us to be a simple church that postures our heart towards obedience to the Holy Spirit. To saying, we'll, we'll say yes to you. We'll follow you. We'll trust you. Even when it's risky, even when it's costly, we will follow you. And I'm trusting him for that outcome. So I asked Janith to come up. Janith is our missions pastor here at Frontline. His life has been a yes before how. Grew up in India in 2011, was pursuing a computer science degree, felt like God uh, called him into ministry. Two years later, God called him to Chicago with $750 in his pocket. God provided a scholarship to the school he was at, provided for his housing, provided jobs. I mean, it, the steps that God has led him to that actually brought him here would blow your mind. And so here, here's what I asked him to do for today is for us just to carve out a little bit of time right now just to get on our knees in prayer and say, God, what, what is the yes that you are asking us to step into? What, as a church or as a family, as a marriage, as an individual, what is the yes that God is asking us to step into? And, and I could think of no better person for this right now than to lead us through for Janine. So, yeah, would you? Thank you. Uh, just like, this morning, I don't know what God put in your hearts, like which area of your life you're trying to say yes to God area of your life are trying to be obedient to God. But I can say in our humanness there's fear and doubt and anxiety which stops us from saying yes to God. So this morning I want to say, I want to remind uh, Romans, uh, Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 1 verse 5 that true obedience comes from a place of faith. In faith 
faith comes in knowing God. So I invite you to a time of prayer. And I'll kneel down. And if you're able, uh, please kneel with me. Go to our Father's presence and spend some time discerning Him and asking Him to strengthen us. We hope this message encouraged you to know who God is and who you are in him. If you want to take a next step, visit frontlinegr.com slash next. We look forward to connecting with you there and we'll see you back here next week.